Welcome to Ålesund, the Bacalao capital of Norway, if not the world. My native Norway is a small and peaceful country far away up north on the globe. Yet there are times when I feel as though I come from a superpower, when people from far away surprise me with their immediate recognition. Ah, Norwega! Norvege, Norway, they say, always followed by the reason for their enthusiasm. This dried and salted cod, or bacalao as it's known, in many parts of the world, most notably in Portugal and Spain, West Africa, the Caribbean and Brazil, this is considered the finest food on earth. And today's programme is devoted to the bacalao and the fascinating story of the fish that had to become a global superstar before it was appreciated at home. I'll start off by making a warming onion soup with port wine, and I'll also show you how to make a proper bacalao stew, the best one-pot dish I know. Norway has always been a seafaring nation, and fishing is still one of the country's main industries. I've caught a ride on a school ship where tomorrow's fishermen are being trained in their craft. This is what we're looking for. Probably the most important fish in world history at least definitely the most important fish in Norwegian history, a codfish, what we use to make bacalao. I love fresh cod, I love the way the white flaky flesh curls up when you cook it. But of course, fresh cod doesn't keep well. And throughout the years, people have developed quite ingenious ways of preserving the fish, not as ingenious as the making of bacalao. The fish is gutted, the spinal cord removed, and the head chopped off. And then it's placed in salt for two to three days, and then it's placed out on the cliffs to dry for as much as three months. And the reason why the bacalao was made just here in this region is that the climate is unusually dry and unusually cold. Of course, today the bacalao is made in factories under very controlled conditions, but even today, on a nice sunny day like this, I can feel the cold cutting through my bones and it's time to make myself a warming onion soup. The onion soup I'm going to make will be wonderfully sweet. The sweetness comes both from the onions, the onion is the vegetable that contains the most sugar, and also from the addition of some port wine that really has an interesting local uh, aspect to it as well. I always cry when I chop onions. It's somewhat better with red onions. Of course, the flavor uh, from the red onions is milder as well. Now, this is my fifth onion, so I'm done. I can feel the first tear coming its way, but I won't start crying anyway.
I'm sautéing the onions in quite a generous amount of butter, three or four tablespoons. You can, of course, cut it down a little bit. And I'm adding a bit of oregano and three bay leaves. The point now is to sauté the onions over medium-low heat so that they caramelize and develop their wonderful sweetness without getting burned. And that takes quite an amount of time, about 20 minutes. Now the onions are just about right. And as you can see, they've started to collapse and they're kind of brown towards the edges and they are wonderfully sweet. I'm going to take that sweetness and enhance it and build on it by adding port. Port wine has a long, long history here because the buyers of Bacalao were Portuguese and Spanish people and the Portuguese didn't always have that much money to pay for the fish and at least they preferred to barter it for port wine. So port wine has always been uh, common here in this region and it's kind of been cheap whereas port wine is expensive other places in the world it's been very very cheap here i'm just going to boil out the alcohol from the port i used almost a deciliter about half a cup and i'm removing the bay leaves they've done their duty and now i'm adding the onions to about a quart about a liter of stock now, I'm using chicken stock instead of beef stock because it has a much milder flavour and it goes very well together with all that sweetness. Now, I'm just bringing this to a boil and then the soup is done. I'll just taste it. Yeah, I think I managed to strike the right balance between port wine and onion flavour. So, what remains is to scoop it into deep plates Look at that colour. And some relatively dry bread. This is yesterday's merchandise. You would rather have stale bread than fresh bread. And I'm going to gratiné it with cheese, Jarlsberg cheese. And here comes my favorite part, the cool tool for big boys. This is really for making creme brulee, but it's excellent for melting cheese as well. And now it's done. Of course, it's much simpler to do this at home under your broiler in your normal oven. Hi. Up until quite recently, this is how it looked all along the coastline. Wherever there'd be a bare-faced rock or just plain rocky like this, there'd be bacalao drying up. And, of course, the bacalao industry was the main source of revenue for the entire community here. But the bacalao industry was a job for women. And, therefore, the women in this region have always been incredibly independent-minded. And, of course, they could be. They had their own job, independent of their husband, and they had their own salary. So now the fish is ready to be exported to faraway places. This box is going to Rio de Janeiro. 
and so am I. So, here we are in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And nowhere is the bacalao more appreciated than in the Portuguese and Spanish-speaking parts of the world. Here in Brazil, everyone that can afford it will eat a bacalao at least twice a year for Christmas and for Easter. In Portuguese, the bacalao is sometimes referred to as fie amigo, faithful friend. But the story of the bacalao also raises some questions. How can a delicious but still quite modest fish from a wonderful but still quite insignificant country go and conquer the world? How can it make passions flow on the other side of the world, like here in Brazil? <laughs> Se eu perguntar para o rei da Noruega, ele abaixar o preço do bacalhau, que está muito caro. Tá bom? Ok? <risos> the explanation is at least partly a religious one. From the 16th century on, the Catholic Church introduced more and more days of Lent, when people would have to observe meatless days. And this was somewhat of a problem, especially in heavily populated areas and in areas in the south, where, of course, fresh fish wouldn't keep for more than a few hours. The Norwegian dried and salted cod came in as a rescuer. It allowed people not only to eat well, but also to observe the rules of their religion. And as Christianity spread to the rest of the world, to Africa and South America, the tradition of eating bacalao spread with it. And it is said that there are more than 365 different ways of preparing the bacalao, more than one for every day of the year. And in olden days, it was said that a woman would have to know them all before she could get married. But, but this is the most expensive, right? The best bacalao from Norway. Six and a half kilos, that's nearly 15 pounds. Yeah. A typical Brazilian supermarket will be stocked not only with bacalao, but with many different types of bacalao from the very, very cheap versions that's been made from say via versions with Pollock to the most exclusive one, the ones using Norwegian codfish. And almost everyone agrees that this one is the best. It has that white, flaky flesh of the codfish. Then, after having become a superstar in the rest of the world, including Brazil and Rio de Janeiro, the bacalao returned back home to Olesen. In the mid-19th century, trade regulations in Spain made it more profitable for Spanish merchants to come here than for Norwegians to ship the bacalao to Spain. And for a couple of decades, Olesen was virtually a Norwegian-Spanish city. There were Spanish merchants crawling around the city and by the time the Spanish left in the late 19th century, the bacalao stew had become the most important local dish here in Olesen, and it has been ever since.
it's serious bacalao time, it's time for me to make the famous bacalao stew. I've moved up now to the roof of Olesen with a wonderful view of the city and also of that mountain over there, which very appropriately is called the Sugar Top Mountain, just as in Rio. Uh, I've had bacalao stew in Africa, in the United States, in South America, in Portugal, Spain, and of course here in Olesen. And most of the tomato-based bacalaos are very similar, but there's something about the people who make the bacalao, they have a tendency to quarrel. And nowhere uh, more than here in Olesen, I don't know two people from this city who would agree upon a recipe. So what I'm going to make now will be my bacalao stew, based on traditions, but interpreted by me. The bacalao itself is far too salty and far too dry to use. Uh, it contains almost no water and it is really quite hard. Um, if it was any harder, you could use it as a weapon. Uh, so what I've done is take a piece of bacalao and soak it in water for two and a half days. Now it is much, much softer, not quite as soft as normal fresh codfish, but soft enough to use. It's still quite salty, but the salt will lend itself to the rest of the stew and ideally the uh, end result will be perfect. So what I have to do now is remove the skin. It's not particularly difficult, but it is something that you might want to consider having your fishmonger do for you. You can also buy pre-soaked and pre-skinned bacalao. I'm just taking off the part with the fin and then the fish is ready for cooking. I'm going to use the traditional guillotine. The guillotine was, of course, originally invented by the French under very dramatic circumstances. This version of it is invented by the Portuguese and it's used at Rua do Arsenal in Lisbon and it's used to chop dry bacalao and it is wonderful to have the guillotine brought to use in such a peaceful and constructive manner. Now the slices are about this thick as thick as my finger and look at the fish it has that white flaky shiny flesh and actually it doesn't taste too bad even uncooked because it has been salted so it has gone through a sort of curing process and it is very different from fresh cod now that was the hard part the rest is easy the bacalao is a one pot wonder and all you really have to do is slice the ingredients i'll start off with the onions just slicing them into thin slices more or less thin it, i'm going to cook it for a couple of hours so it doesn't really matter exactly how thick you make them but something like this. Now, this is hard for me. I'm not very good with onions and strangely enough, it is more difficult for me to make the bacalao than the onion soup. And it is, of course, because I'm using white onions this time and they are more sulfurous than the red ones. But that was the last one. Potatoes are easy. Just slicing the potatoes in more or less the same thickness as the onions. And now just placing the onions and potatoes and codfish in kind of like layers. That's how I do it at least. And it's not that easy to say anything about the quantity, but I would say that I have just about as much onions and potatoes combined as I have fish. And of course, if you want a more pungent flavor, you have more onions than potatoes. And if you want a milder flavor and a thicker consistency, you have more potatoes. 
but this is really a recipe where you can't really go wrong. Uh, but here comes a part where you can go wrong, the spice. I have here some piri piris, the, some of the strongest red hot chili peppers there are. There's so much fire in one tiny little chile here that I'm only using three or four, and that might even be too much. And garlic, generous amount of garlic. I just take a whole head of garlic and cut it in two and squeeze it in between here. Then it's easy to find them afterwards. They'll, they'll give away some flavor and those of us who like garlic the most can have this one, the treasure. It will have become all soft and wonderful by the time it has cooked. And then some pimentos, sweet, peppers, sweet red peppers. These are imported from Spain. They don't really grow here in this country. So buy them tinned. I need a couple of bay leaves, three or four, just sticking them on the side here. And some peppercorns, black peppercorns, and about 20, 25, black peppercorns. And then we have tomatoes, lots of canned tomatoes. And again, I prefer the canned tomatoes to fresh tomatoes. They have more liquid and of course they're skinned already. The only exception I would add is if you grow your tomatoes yourself, then of course that's much, much better. And enough tomatoes to cover it all and give enough moisture for the whole thing to cook in. Then comes the part that I found very difficult to believe the first time I made a bacalao. My good friend Cecil Quello, who is a chef from Olesen, told me that she uses two and a half cups of olive oil in her bacalao. I'm using slightly less. I'm using about a, a cup and a half, three deciliters, but still that's quite a lot of olive oil, but there is a point to it. It adds a richness to this stew that you can't really get otherwise. That is generous, it certainly is. And then just a sprinkle of parsley, coarsely chopped and it's ready to cook. And I'm cooking it all over medium heat for about an hour and a half. Now, an hour and a half of gentle simmering has passed and the bacalao should be done. It's time for me to taste the result. It has quite a lot of punch from the piri piris and it is perfect in its saltiness because of course the bacalao itself was quite salty and now all the flavors from the bacalao has spread out around and you can taste the pimentos and tomatoes of course. So, but I shouldn't be the judge of this. Uh, I'm serving it to people from Olesen who have grown up with this and they are known to be religious in their belief of the right recipe. Hi. Hi. Oh, my eyes are my brother. Well, there are two of these things. They are made to Olesen. Here is a special thing. Here is a special thing. Did you like it? Was it alright? Keep that home. 
it's really very, very simple. Food to concentrate on eating. Yeah, we're yeah, sorry. Yeah. You can find recipes from New Scandinavian <laughs> Cooking at the website scancook.com. Just 